A few days ago, I received a question from a viewer on how we can know whether the battery of a second-hand EV has been well cared for. That's a really great and important question, as I recommend buying used rather than new. Let's have a talk about that today. I published a video at the start of December 2023 in which I discussed the rule of thumb on charging to only 80% for a car with NMC batteries. That's nickel, manganese, cobalt, the most common form of lithium ion cell. As ever, I will link to that video from the end screen of this one so that you can watch that for more context if you'd like. And I will also be putting it in the description in case that's also a help. Videos I post generally receive the bulk of their views in the first few days of posting, but they don't disappear and remain in place for people to watch if they find them at a later date, perhaps when linked to from other videos. Therefore, the question on that video came in only a week ago, but it seemed a great question, so I wanted to go into a bit of detail about it. After all, my recommendation is to buy cars secondhand, whether EV or not. Cars are mostly a depreciating asset. They are very expensive, and especially so with EVs. And they lose money quickly, most notably in the first year or two of their life. For this reason, I have never bought a new car myself. I prefer to pick something up after some of that initial depreciation has already happened. I have had a couple of pre-registered cars, but mostly I buy something a year or two old. So, when buying an EV secondhand, how can we know that it has been well looked after? Leaving a car with NMC cells, those nickel, manganese, cobalt cells that most cars have, sitting at 100% state of charge for prolonged periods can cause a little more degradation than if we aim to keep it at a lower state of charge under those circumstances. Now let's explain degradation a little bit here for context. Remember there is more detail in that other video. But degradation causes a small, slow reduction in the car's maximum range, its ability to release all of the energy from the battery. It is a small effect, but over the years it will probably add up to a somewhat lower range. If we want a car for long journeys, or we don't have home charging, then looking for a car with less degradation is going to make longer trips more easily manageable. We can think less about having to stop to charge on our journeys. Avoiding the need to use rapid chargers en route will also save us some money. And we will probably feel more confident that the car has plenty of life left in it. The first thing to say is that battery failures are really rare, so we don't need to obsess about the condition of the battery. However, just like the bodywork, the battery health does impact the value of the car, what we should be paying for it. So it is useful to know and understand it. So how can we know? Firstly, it depends from whom you are buying. If you are buying direct from the owner, then there is no harm in asking them how they charged it. Perhaps don't specifically mention percentage and see what happens. If they don't mention without prompting that they charged at 80% or whatever, then it may be something they do not understand and the car is a bit less likely to have benefited from this technique. Talking directly to the owner is not an option that's open to you when you buy from a dealer, of course. And even if you can talk to the former owner, they could fib. So this isn't a guarantee of anything, but it's useful to know if it is an option. The next thing to look at is the range versus battery percentage when you see the car. Degradation is, after all, a reduction in the amount of energy that can be drawn from the car, so that impacts the range at any percentage. Unfortunately, this isn't scientific, as the exact uh, comparison between those figures varies a bit by the current and recent weather conditions and the way the car has previously been driven. But by looking at a couple of cars in similar weather conditions, it might give you the ability to compare them a bit. Another indication you can get is from driving the car on the test drive. Take the car for a reasonable run and keep an eye on the way that the range drops. 
a test drive of a distance that is about a tenth of the expected range of the car should result in the, uh, the battery percentage dropping by no more than 10%, for example. The next piece of evidence we might want to see is a condition report. If you are buying from an EV specialist, then you can ask for a battery condition report. Some specialists might understand your concern and have prepared a report that measures the battery's health. There are two types of report that I know of. One of them is done by interrogating the car and having it tell you its current condition. The second is a much more thorough check calculated by using the car from full charge to near zero and submitting the results to an organisation to check. I think it is unlikely that a dealer will go to the trouble of doing that second type of report, draining the battery, as it takes time to do that and time is money. But some specialists might, so there is no harm in asking. It is worth saying that some cars might offer to do the more detailed type of test for you. In particular, Teslas can now run this full test over a day or two, which you activate from the hidden service menu. So that is an option for Teslas, and where Tesla goes, other manufacturers might eventually follow. So this might become an option in other cars at some later date. However, it is unlikely to be an option yet in anything besides a Tesla, and it needs to be run in advance. So the last thing to talk about is the car's onboard diagnostics. Pretty much all manufacturers do offer something by way of an estimate of the state of health of the battery which is an interesting number to know. This is a figure that we can ask the dealer to tell us, or we can access it ourselves. although it is both appropriate and polite to ask permission from the dealer or owner before doing it ourselves. First, a disclaimer. You do this at your own risk or at the risk of the person who owns the car. There are clones and knockoffs of the dongles we're going to talk about, so you don't really know what you're getting. Try to buy a dongle using a method that allows you some recourse, a reputable seller, or use a credit card which gives you some extra protection. It seems that we need a reasonable OBD dongle for EVs. The most common dongles that are the cheapest, they work fine for petrol cars but they are not necessarily going to do the job for EVs. We need something that has the support for a greater number of protocols and commands. Avoid the ones in the smallest packages, like this. This one doesn't work on my Zoe, for example. I had to get something better than this one. Here is what I got myself. Notice that it's in this plastic case with four screws holding the case together. That might be an indication that it's of the type we want. I think these dongles come in different colours, so it's the shape of the case that's important and the fact that it's got these four screws on and not the colour. I looked for a listing that included the code KW902. That's the model code for the Conway dongle that I was actually after. However, the listing I used didn't include the name Conway. Therefore, despite the cardboard packaging and the case both saying that name, I suspect the one I have here is probably a clone. The listing I used says the brand is DeWiki. I paid just under £25, including prime delivery in the UK, and it arrived in under a day, so it's from a UK seller. I'll put the listing for this one I bought in the description of the video. However, it seems quite common for these dongles to go out of stock very quickly. It looks like Nicholas Ramo tried to maintain links to suitable dongles on his website for a while. But if you look at his site, you can see the number he has listed in the time since he created the page, and that none of those are available anymore. Ideally, you would buy this from a bricks and mortar shop, somewhere where you can see what you're getting, and be able to look someone in the eye if you find it doesn't work and you need your money back. However, if you have to buy online, as I did, then check the comments and feedback for people saying that it worked for them. The more varied feedback, the better. They may talk about apps, for example. Remember that there have been some allegations in the past that some feedback on Amazon is not entirely valid. And beware of bait and switch, where you get sold something cheaper than what was provided to the early buyers who gave the feedback, so make sure the feedback is recent. This dongle I got is not perfect. 
it doesn't seem able to support absolutely all of the features of the software I wanted to try out. But it's plenty good enough for my usage, so I'm expecting to keep this for now. Once we have the dongle, we're going to need some software to make use of it. The easiest is probably to get an app for your phone. There seem to be quite a number of apps, some of which are specific to a make of car, and others that might have wider appeal. The first app I used was Kanzi. This is for the Renault Zoe. Now this app could solely be for Android phones now, as I've heard it said that the iOS or Apple version was removed from the Apple Store some time ago. You'll have to check that yourself with you're an Apple user. There is also Leaf Spy for the Nissan Leaf and Scan My Tesla for the various Tesla models. However, there is a more generic one that might work for a number of makes called Car Scanner. Generally, the apps seem to offer a free version with a paid upgrade to get rid of ads and perhaps get more features in some instances. To make use of the dongle, you're going to need to plug it into the diagnostics port of the car, so finding the port is the first step. The port is often in the driver's footwell or at the bottom of the dashboard on the driver's side, or perhaps sometimes hidden in the centre console, as it is in the early Renault Zoe's underneath a rubber mat in the centre console. Start by making sure that the car is turned off, then plug the dongle into the port. On mine, there is then a little button that we press to enable the Bluetooth pairing mode. So we're going to turn the car on and then press that little button and that will initiate Bluetooth pairing. Then you go into the Bluetooth settings screen of your phone and the dongle should now show up as an available device to which we can pair. Choose it and enter the four digit security code, which is generally going to be either 0000 or 1234 if you've not been given anything else. The next bit of the procedure, actually looking up the state of health of the battery, is of course going to vary by app. However, it should be fairly straightforward. Give yourself some time to do this, to learn what you can get on that particular car with the software you're using. So start the app you chose on your phone. Go into its settings and select the correct Bluetooth device for the app to talk to. You will also need to tell it the make and model of the car, after which you can explore the app and see what useful information you can find. Here's what Kanzi looks like on my phone when connected to my Renault Zoe. From the initial screen, I click on battery and get a screen with these four panels. There are cell voltages and temperatures shown on graphs at the bottom. But on the top left of this screen, that large number is the state of health. This is the figure that the car calculates as an estimate of the health of the main traction battery. That's the one that we're probably most interested in. For my car, we can see that it is 97.63%. I'm amused that it's giving a figure to two decimal places. I think it's unlikely that the estimation can be that accurate in reality. However, a figure of about 97.5 seems about right for my car. My Zoe is about 20 months old at this point, with about 8,000 miles travelled to date. That's because the car was more or less unused for the first six months of its life, because it was effectively a leased car that was never leased. Now all cars vary, but the general expectation seems to be that the car might lose about 2% state of health in the first year, and then the loss might tail off to more like 1% per year after the first year or two. So 97.5% seems to fit well with that general expectation. I'm not disappointed with that figure. It's a similar process in Car Scanner. When you first set the app up, it walks you through the settings in a wizard. Now I didn't screen record that the first time. However, here you can see me going into the settings to confirm the car is a Renault Zoe. In this case, I use the Zoe 2 profile, as I think that's probably the right one but it could be that the Zoe Phase 2 is actually a better match to my car. It's a case of trial and error a little bit. I then go into the adapter setup and ensure that I have my Conway Bluetooth dongle selected. Back on the main screen, I can click connect at the bottom and wait a few seconds for it to talk to the various modules in the car. 
From the options on the main screen, I can then choose dashboard to see a summary of information. Battery condition is shown in the centre on the second row from the bottom, again reporting 97.63%. You can also scroll to one side to get other screens of information if you want them. Bear in mind that the dongle is using power from the lead acid accessory battery, so it's best to disconnect it when it's not in use. And I think it's also best to have the car turned off when connecting and disconnecting the dongle. That reduces the risk to the car and to the adapter. So that's it, I think. There is some trial and error involved here, so get someone else to do this if you don't feel confident with this process. And just walk away from a car if you aren't sure about something. There will always be other cars. So if something doesn't seem right, step away and think over some time about whether you're comfortable with what it is you're seeing. Thanks very much for joining me. I hope you found this video useful. Your questions and comments are most welcome in the section below on this subject. If you've liked the video, then it's a help to me if you click the thumbs up button. That tells YouTube that you've enjoyed it and YouTube may promote it to others based upon that. And of course, click subscribe if you want to see more. Thanks.